the ambulance. Oh, I see. I Not see. ambulance, ambience. It's for the start of the, um, the intro and all that kind of stuff. Okay, welcome to um, the latest edition of the Conquer Food podcast, uh, the Conquer Food show with me and Paula Williams. Um, today, I've managed to track Paula down. She's not feeling too good. A um, little bit under weather, aren't you? Well, I've um, I've been fighting these little colds for ages and I thought I had the most strongest immune system ever, but um, it's it's finally gotten a hold of me. So it's amazing uh, yeah. that you're here today yeah. and you're going you're gonna to record this podcast. So... I promised at the start of the year that we was going to bring you some inspirational stories from the people at Team Bootcamp. And quite often, there's no story quite as inspirational as that as Paula. So I've absolutely just got her right arm up her back and really given her as much monkey scrubs and Chinese burns to get her to do this podcast today. So we're going to dive a little bit deeper into your, into your past history. Um, I can't promise we won't have any tears because uh, you do get a little bit teary sometimes. Um, but I can promise that you're going to be as open and as honest as you feel appropriate. Is that right? Yes. Um, and I would just like to say that this is because I love you, Craig, and for <laughs> no other reason, because I'm actually quite private. Um, I think I have shared my story with some of my conquer foodies, but it's not something I shout from the rooftops. And it's not not it's not anything I'm ashamed of, because I'm, I'm actually quite proud of my... Um, of, of how I've come through, but I've definitely struggled a wee bit, as yeah. a lot of people have. Okay, you know, we're gonna we're gonna sort of get into that a little bit. So, um, yeah. so so just give us if we could sort of sum up your your life uh -huh. up to now. Yeah. In one, I want to give people like a bit of a feel for for what's coming up. Um, if you could explain it in like three words, what what words would you use? <laughs> Um, good question, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is actually a really good question. Um, mm, extreme, but extreme isn't enough. I mean, extreme depths of despair and heights of joy. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. So, okay, so it's probably worth um, talking a little bit about uh, what you was like as a child growing up. Yeah. Maybe maybe that's a good place to start, and then and then we kind of work all the way up through a few questions and answers to this point right now, and, and how you kind of found yourself here. So, yeah. um, and the reason why we're doing that is, like I said, is we we kind of want you to. Sometimes it's really easy to look at people and just go, you know what, they've got all their shit together, and um, and everything's fine, and everything's great, and you know, if only my life was like that. And I know some people have got some incredible lives, but we're fortunate enough to have an incredible life together and um some people might look at that and think oh you know what we had it as easy as them um but that's that's not always the case so um so yeah start us off what what was what was childhood like and well well actually my childhood was amazing i grew up in um, a little village in essex um surrounded by a really wonderful loving family so my childhood was amazing i was loved sport at, at, at primary school i was really sporty so i lived for netball and rounders <laughs> and um but then I went to secondary school and hit puberty and turned into the demon from hell quite <laughs> literally so uh, so this is when when things start to change yeah. is when you you start to grow up and, and w w when you say demon from hell what 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 kind of things are we are we talking um, about I, I just wasn't a particularly nice kid to be around it's not not the case at school it, this is with my my family especially my mum she she suffered really quite badly at the at the at the hands of my emotions, really. Um, I was. But is it like normal teen stuff? That I think everyone goes so. Through? I, th I think it is normal teen stuff, and I think for a lot of people, as I, I can't speak for guys, I haven't done a lot of, of research into men and their their hormones, but I know girls, especially when they start their periods and hormones start kicking in, that they can get a bit, a bit mean. <laughs> <laughs> so go on and get, paint a mean, picture. I mean, mean, what, uh, mean as far as I c I was concerned, it was an understatement. But again, not not with people at not at school, not with people at school. I was quite passive actually. Um, just followed the gang because it was really important to me to be part of a a crowd. And but inside, I was really, really desperately struggling. I was desperately unhappy, and I used to feel as if I had no right to be on this earth, which might sound like a, a really crazy thing, but. I've, you know, we talk about now when, when you have your own business and I've laughed and joked about it with so many people, the imposter syndrome, you know, where you, you kind of think that you're going to get found out soon. And I, I've, I've felt like that 
well, I did, especially as a child, that I was kind of here under false pretenses that I had no rights to be on this earth. It's a really funny feeling, but it was quite distressing for me. And what, um, so did you, you know, it doesn't doesn't tell as much. Most people might think, yeah, I was a little shit when I was a kid as well, but yeah. like, you know, what kind of stuff was going on? I mean, was you, was you tested for anything? Was you... Um, I was taken backwards and forwards to the doctors, um, and this is in the early 80s, and I was told that I was highly strong. <laughs> that <laughs> oh, I can confirm. Yeah. She is highly uh, yeah, strong. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I was told. I was just highly strong. It had nothing to do with, you know, hormones. It had nothing to do with puberty. I was just a overly anxious child. Um, but then when I was 16, I started having really bad panic attacks, which, and, and something that makes me really sad about this day and age is there are so many young people now suffering from anxiety and, and panic attacks. Yeah. We'll have a chat about that at a later stage. But then it was it was quite not very common, really. Um, uh, yeah, and, and how did people react? Like when you, I mean, where would, are we talking just at home or was it no, out in public? No, or? it was when I was out in public as well and, and it didn't go down too well. I think I, I got a little bit of a reputation for being kind of the mad person. I, re I remember I was laughing with a friend the other day. There was a rumour that went round that, that Paula Gager, because that was my name at the time, was used to sit at the back of the bus and rock backwards and forwards. <laughs> but that's how kind of mental health was, was seen then. It was something to be be really, really afraid of. But um, f finally, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but when I was 16, I was diagnosed with what was called manic depression then. It's now called bipolar disorder, but I was diagnosed with um, manic depression and um, carted off to a psychiatric hospital. So that, so was, the, that was the first time you was yeah. kind of locked up yeah <laughs> um so for those people that don't really understand bipolar disorder yeah. or manic depression as it was then i mean what just like in, in a few words like what what, well, what, what we're dealing it's, with it's just it's a mood disorder um and you swing quite literally from being euphoric and and when i say euphoric i mean euphoric i mean i've i've had some highs that i wouldn't want to swap for anything <laughs> you know it, it, you can take yourself to places that some people never in their lifetime will experience but we live in a, a world of polarity and so you know if your body is able to go to that kind of heights it has to be able to go to the the depths to the opposite and um already at, at age 16 i was suffering really bad bouts of um of mania almost and and really you know low wanting to to end my life and self-harming and 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 i think it's it's much more accept well not acceptable because it's still distressing but we, we know so much more about it now but in the early 80s nobody could understand why i behaved in such a way it was i was being naughty you know how could i go to school and perform so well so and then all like of a, a sudden yeah. not be capable of of doing the things that i could do you know i was just deemed as being naughty really and so and who sort of felt the, the brunt of all this? I mean, who was... My mum. My poor mum. Was she just in despair? Was, you know, yeah, she was in despair. I mean, we, we laugh, you know, well, we joke about it now, but my mum used to say, you know, she'd hear the gate go at the end of the the garden and feel physically ill because Paula was arriving. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. And, and it is funny, we, we do laugh, but I mean, you've obviously, just to put your mind at ease, obviously she's come a long way, a long way since that. Yeah. And perhaps we can talk about some of the strategies and that that you use yeah. in a bit. But, um, okay, so we fast forward. I mean, was there a particular low point when you was a teen or, I mean? Um, I struggled all throughout my teenage years. My teenage years were, were not good years for me and they weren't good years for my family. And I think it was a mixture of hormones and and everything kind of kicking in you know um so it, it wasn't a good time for me um but what it did is it set me on this path of running away I suppose mm. when I look back on my life uh, you know every every kind of certain amount of years I've I've packed up and and moved um and changed everything completely um and that was the only way that I could seem to come out of a bad episode was to change everything so what what other kind of patterns did you you identified or did you experience? Um, well, obviously, um, you know, I have had problems with drugs because when you feel um, despair almost, 
you will look to anything to make yourself feel better. And, and actually, I think that's what's amazing about human beings. We're all about survival. And, and, and it's really funny and, and contradictory to say, but for somebody who at so many points in my life has wanted to end it, that survival instinct within me is really, really strong. And I believe that's why I've achieved some of the things that I've achieved because I've always believed that things can and, and will get better. Um, but I turned to um, drugs to try and make myself feel better. Um, I, at certain points in my life, was the person you would want to party with <laughs> 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 because I was the best fun ever because... I would, I would take everything I could possibly lay my hands on to make myself feel better. And um, there's a really amazing man who um, I'm reading his book at the moment and his name is Gabor Mate for anyone that, that knows. And he, he is really prevalent in the, in the world of addictions. And he, I read somewhere that he's, he, he obviously counsels and looks after people um, in the projects in New York. So people that are really, really struggling with with drugs and uh, drugs have been their life, their whole life and their parents' life. And the first thing he says to people with addictions is well done. And this just kind of blew my mind. It was well done for finding something to help ease your pain. Mm. Um, and I know I told you this the other day and it's just really resonated and stuck with me because you, it fills you with such self-loathing. But actually, that's all you're doing. You're searching for something to alleviate a pain that can be desperate and we talked about drugs but was food food came a bit later on oh, um okay. i mean i did restrict what i ate when i was younger but that's because i believed that if i was thin i would be happy i believed that you know happiness what, what are the beliefs let's let's just some of the other beliefs that you had when you was younger when i was so this is my 20s yeah, really yeah. i believed that i needed to be thin in order to be accepted and again this is in it was in the well early 90s um it's even worse now and it breaks my heart for people. But I believed I needed to be thin um, in order to be accepted. I believed I needed to be wealthy yeah. in order to be acceptable. Um, I had a, a strong underlying belief underneath all of these things that I wasn't worthy. I can remember being out in a nightclub and looking around at all the hundreds of people in there and thinking, I have no right to be here. I've got no right to be on this on this planet or in this world. I'm... I'm here by, I don't know why I'm here. It was a really horrible, frightening feeling. So I believed my self-worth was really incredibly low. Um, so I, I didn't believe in in much other than searching for things to get rid of the belief. Soothers. Of, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so you're talking about being in the hospital. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I, I, I just can't imagine life in a is it, what is it like a secure hospital? what do they call it? what's the term yeah psychiatric. It's a psychiatric hospital and um um they're called a, i don't know what they are now because i've been out of one for 10 years but <laughs> it's the last time i went into hospital but it was an acute ward then and um it's got to be a celebration on it 10 years yeah yeah it has got to be a celebration but um it was a really frightening experience for me and and um but but actually it really opened my eyes to the suffering of people um and and I I met some really amazing people in hospital and people from all walks of life. Funnily enough, you know, mental illness strikes everyone. Yeah, um, that's something that's you know it's really important to remember. Um, A bit like cancer, I suppose. It just does not discriminate. No, exactly, exactly. Um, so as, as such a young person, you know, finding yourself in a psychiatric hospital was was scary. So what? Um, yeah. So have you got any standout moments there that? Um, some juicy moments. <laughs> That's what I'm well, after. Well, somebody, whenever you go into psychiatric hospital, somebody always thinks they're Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and so I Hang go, on. Uh, Did you think you was Jesus? No, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. <laughs> there was a naked man who would run around preaching. You know, that was always um, really funny. There was one girl who, who absolutely broke my heart who believed that everything she touched turned to mold. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. That was really sad. And, um, there were people that had had electroconvulsive treatment who who had no memory and no recall of, of what was going on. I mean, it does come back, so, you know, don't be frightened of that. But it, it, it's... And how was you treated in there? Um, when, when I first went into hospital, I don't know whether I'm allowed to say this really, but not, not particularly well. It, it was still quite archaic. It was it was not yeah. a great place. I remember they changed my medication and um, I was um, 
went into withdrawals and, and not not very well and was told that I just had a tummy bug. I mean, now I would say, are you kidding me? <laughs> 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 but at the time, time I was young and I just, just went along with it and I was really, really frightened. And I also... Um, so was the adults in... Yeah. You know, so it wasn't like a teen... No, hospital you were nice. straight in there with the adults yeah, i'm sure that wouldn't it must have been now. petrified yeah. was you? i mean how I, do you know i don't really remember being petrified because yeah. i think i was really low anyway and when you first go into hospital they give you so many medications you just sleep yeah. <laughs> so you know um yeah incredible then how long did you stay in there i think i was been there for about four or five weeks yeah and so when, when you came out do you remember like the first days of kind of getting no, out no i don't actually i don't really remember that at all that I don't. I just remember. I, I really don't. Yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? But I don't remember what I did the first time or anything. That. But the one thing that I, I do know is that I hadn't learned anything. What? And what I mean by that is when I look back on life now, um, and I suppose that's the one beautiful thing about being 50 is the wisdom that comes with life experience and when I was in hospital, I was just given medications until I was kind of stable again. But that very first time, I didn't learn anything about emotions myself. Um, I just went back out a bit more medicated to the same old life. And so, so how many times have you been into hospital then? I mean, can you just give us a, like through four, your adulthood? Four. four times. I thought three, but uh, obviously yeah. I don't know. I don't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I mean, this is, you know... I don't. I don't know this stuff. Like we've never really spoke at depth no. about this stuff. So, you okay? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, just give me a little. So what happened then through the rest of kind of adulthood before well, before things started kind of picking up? I mean, in in um in my late twenties, I married, got married, and tried to have babies, and found out I was infertile and couldn't have children. Um, and so I went on a program of IVF. Um, and it was after the last lot of IVF. I found out I wasn't pregnant, that I ended up back in hospital. So I think uh, all, all of that kind of um, triggered a, a bit of an episode. So that that's what set um, that time off. And then time after that, I just wasn't very well. I'd had some bad problems with drugs and wasn't mixing with people that were doing me any good, really. Um, uh, and I... I can't even remember what happened then, but so uh, how w when you pick up this label of bipolar disorder, yeah. I mean, uh, how has that sort of affected your life? I mean, is is there things that you've um, been unable to do, or how how it's affected my life is I've always been exceptionally good when I'm good. So I've had some amazing jobs, I've had amazing friends, I've lived in some amazing places, and then. It, it feels, whether it is or not, I don't know, but almost overnight you wake up and you are not that person anymore. You know, this highfalutin job that you have where you're doing presentations and, and being really successful all of a sudden terrifies you. Um, and and the other thing about that is people know you. The one thing I've learned uh, over my life is that people know you as this fun, gregarious person. And when you change, people just can't handle it. Mm. And and so don't like has, it. It, has it stopped you getting a mortgage? Has, or did the, how did the doctors react to you? You know what I mean? I'm just wondering. Um, no, but I wanted to go to a kibbutz once and I wasn't allowed kibbutz. to, yeah, to, was to go. In in Israel, I wanted to go over and live like on a commune and work for your... <laughs> and I wasn't was allowed to go because of my mid-12. that during a particular high no, period? <laughs> no, probably. <laughs> okay, well, listen, we're going to have a little break there. Um, and then when we kind of, when we come back, we'll perhaps talk about the, the immediate future that now, you know, last couple of years, and then also some of the things that you use perhaps to to pull yourself out mm. of all that, you know, and, and now life's changed. Happy with that? Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Anything you want to say just before we have a little break? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, cool. This podcast would not be made possible without the help of Team Bootcamp, an incredible place where people travel from all over the world to learn how to think, eat and move better in pursuit of a greater image, but also to finally get a grip of food. If you're interested in Team Bootcamp or anything that we do, visit team-bootcamp.com. Right, okay, so so we're back. We're talking to Paula. Paula's given a very honest and open insight into her past, and and um, I've learned stuff that I didn't know about her. Uh, one thing's for sure, I think we can all agree that you're a little warrior 
you know, as in a warrior, <laughs> not, not, a wo- not a warrior. <laughs> warrior, you know, oh, a warrior. I'm certainly one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we, we kind of said we were going to start talking about, you know, when did things start picking up? Obviously, it's been a lifelong journey, but when did things really start to change and what was the big lessons that you um, kind of took from that? Things started to change in my 40s. I had some really kind of unhealthy relationships. And then in my 40s, I went to live um, in Norfolk by the sea. And I had... Um, by design or is that something that just came about or you was like, no, I need to no, be... No, I, yeah, I went up to live near my family because my family had moved up there because I grew up in Essex and they'd, yeah. they'd moved up. And um, I had a psychotic episode for the first time in my life, which I, <laughs> I can laugh about now. And I'm sure people will laugh, but... It, w- it was pretty terrifying at the time. I, I, I thought that the devil was chasing me up the beach. And I went running up to the local kind of surgery and flung the doors open and screamed to the whole waiting room. The devil was chasing me up the beach. Is the devil a good runner? Yeah, yeah, he was a good runner. <laughs> and, um, and I ended up in hospital. Wow, that's a bit of a... Um, so just do, hang on, let's just... So, so what exactly... So you flew these... You flung these doors open. yeah. I mean, how do people react? Well, I, mean, uh, I don't really remember, to be honest. No. If, if I'm honest, no. No, and I well, can just, just remember the terror of running up the, just sat, sat you up down the hill. And, and Yeah, and then I just... A, a, a lot of the times that I've ended up in hospital, I can't really remember much about the, the hours running up to it, if I'm, if I'm honest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, carry on. This great. Um, so you went back into hospital? Yeah, I went back into hospital. But this time, something just changed and what happened was that uh, every day um in in these years i mean y- you're talking kind of like 25 years now so the care that you have in psychiatric hospital or that i had in psychiatric hospital was completely different um you know sort of 25 30 or well, 25 years later so um two things happened in hospital one was i had um treatment called dbt and they did mindfulness as well so I was introduced what to... Is, what is DBT? DBT is dialectal behavioural therapy, which is not dissimilar to um, CBT. There are slight right. differences, but but it's, it's called dialectal behavioural therapy. So there was a lot more kind of therapy um, available. So I had art therapy and um, DBT and mindfulness. And there was this beautiful room that you could go to um, and just relax in. We used to do guided meditations. And I went into this room one day laid on a beanbag, put on the plonky plonk music, you know, the nice spa type music and, um, and just relaxed. And I had a dream meditation. Who, who knows? It doesn't, doesn't matter what, what it was, but I dreamt I was at a waterfall mm. and I remember this waterfall was just incredible and it was so pretty and there was all lights and colors bouncing off it and it was just so nice. And, and I walked up to the waterfall and there was a, a man the other side. Now, please Nobody think I'm having a psychopathic episode when I tell you this. Remember, it was a dream or a meditation. And I, um, there was this man in with really long hair and, and robes the other side of the waterfall. And he held his arm out to me and, and kind of pulled me across. And I held his hand and kind of walked through this waterfall. And, and I remember thinking, why am I not wet? This is really weird. Anyway, this, this man gave me a hug. And even now, it makes, it makes me feel a little bit emotional to... Uh, this hug... It, I've never experienced anything like it in my life. I just, oh. Well up. <laughs> I just felt safe. Probably for the first for time. For the first time in my life, I felt safe. And um, so... That's all I remember. I must have woke up or whatever. But what I do know is every day I went back to that room, closed my eyes, put on the plonky plonk music and um, tried to see this man again, but he never came. But what I started to do without realising was teach myself how to meditate. Mm. So by the time I left hospital, I knew that one, I wanted to go and learn how to meditate because it made me feel so wonderful. It made me relax in a way that medication and drugs never had done. It gave me a feeling of safety and oneness. I could be calm 
within my own body without using anything else to make you know to get to get that feeling it's incredible how to think that for years your your mind had kind of almost controlled you yeah and then suddenly was it yeah. a case that you could suddenly control your mind a little bit yeah well I, I think they were teaching us mindfulness as well um on the ward and obviously this therapy that I was having you know it was starting to introduce to me things I was just kind of getting these almost subliminal messages that you are what you think yeah. and that the life that you're living, to a degree you've created, yes, you have bipolar disorder, but there are things that you can do to alleviate your symptoms and there are things that you can do outside or alongside medication that can help you live a good and normal life. And I, and I started to, to believe this. All of a sudden I was receptive and, and ready for it really. Do you think you'd have been ready as a, as a child? You know, when you were 16, was you ready for it then? or? Oh, I don't know, Craig. I, I, no. I really can't answer that question. I mean, it would have been very welcomed, but I just I just don't. Mm. I, I don't know, you know. And um, so then I decided I was going to go learn how to, to meditate. So I, I went and learned how to meditate. And in doing that, I started to meet spiritually minded people. And all of a sudden, I was surrounded by good, kind, loving people. People that believed in the universe and wonderful things. And that, you know, by just being kind to yourself and kind to other people, you could bring this and, and manifest it in your own life. So this whole kind of world of spirituality opened up to me. However... I had not long had the devil chasing me up the beach. <laughs> so a lot of spirituality is about faith and I was not prepared to have 100% faith in my brain <laughs> because it could be a little bit unpredictable. And so... As in hand your thoughts and actions over to something that you didn't trust right now? Yeah, I, I just wasn't 100% prepared to believe in angels and the universe and energy and all of these things because... I was still a bit raw, you yeah. know, I was just learning. And so so what I actually did is I started um, researching crystals and energy. Um, and that took me down the route of um, Hewlett Packard and why they use um, crystals, why we use them crystals in computers and, and all different things because they vibrate and that took me on to quantum physics on the most basic level. I have actually asked the universe to send me back as a quantum physicist. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> because I, I'm so fascinated by energy. But I, but I started looking and, and researching energy from a scientific standpoint and not kind of a blind spiritual faith. So you were uh, so looking for science to support... Yeah, the that, things okay. that were, were coming into my life that were making me feel emotions and feelings that were good and and was something I've never experienced in in my life um so that went on for a little while and oh, then what did you find what I mean what conclusion did you come to or is it still ongoing no it's still ongoing it's still yeah. ongoing but I started to realize that um w when our body and our, our our brain and our emotion and um are not separate you know, and, and I started to look at, at consciousness and I started to realize that if I thought positively and my actions were positive, positivity would come back to me. Mm. And it was such a, an enlightening, empowering, wonderful feeling. I just felt safe inside. And I started to lose the feelings of self-loathing and self-hatred. I didn't want to harm myself anymore. I just wanted to nurture myself and and look after myself. Yeah. And did you did you have a mentor or people that you turned yeah, to? Yeah, well lots of people started coming into my life then. I went to um I went and did a few courses because actually over the years I'd, I've dipped in and out of massage and reiki and so I'd kind of dipped into these things but not really known. So why. is that like a, like is that like a physical manifestation of help the desire to help people or Yeah, absolutely. I mean I can't bear people the thought of people suffering emotional pain. I, I just can't can't bear it. Or animals. Or, or animals or anything. Like the world pain affects it's me. It's just just me, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. I'm the only thing that's allowed yeah. to have any kind of pain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and um I, I was just I was just found myself in this world of of wonderfulness almost. 
Um, but don't get me wrong, it's you know life still comes along and and yeah hits you with a P- hammer and pulls a rug from yeah. Underneath but you. I started to learn the resources and the tools that I needed to pull myself back. When uh, have you just got tough. like like one or two quick? reference points or something anyone watching this going you know what i could freaking do with a bit of this in my life i mean how would you sort of say people get started or um i think at the moment as much as i am a bit um you know i i don't put myself out there on social media on on social media there are so many amazing positive things now and i think awareness is a really key thing and it's becoming aware of of how you talk to yourself it's it's about getting to know yourself Mm. um uh and so i I always say to people surround yourself by the things that you would like to become so if you want to be a more positive more relaxed more calm person then seek all of those things out seek those kind of people i follow on instagram i'm a total instagram voyeur i don't put anything on there because like i say i'm quite private i can't believe i'm doing this even but um but I follow, you know, I get positive statements coming through to me constantly. I follow healing things and moon things. And so so surround yourself literally by, by those things. I mean, I know I said in the last time we spoke, express gratitude. Start, start getting in the habit of appreciating good things. So how, how do you deal with, for the, you know, let's play devil's advocate, right? Yeah. Uh, but... Like not everybody's good, you know what I mean? And sometimes you might think, well, I'll, I'll do this, this something nice for somebody. And and what happens if like they take advantage of it or if they, they steal something from you or whatever, you know what I mean? How do you well, kind of... I, I always think, you know, you, you can't be responsible, you can only be responsible for y- yourself. Now, if I, if I d- do something which I think is loving for somebody else... I think you have to do that altruistically and not expect anything in return. And that's a really hard thing to do because what happens with a lot of us is we'll do something for somebody and then get cross because it's not been appreciated or they've not done it back. Well, or they've not reacted in the yeah, way in which you, you think know, they should. We are actually don't have any right to expect that of people. Yeah. you know. But that's when it comes to surround yourself by people that enhance you, by people that bring good things to you um i know when it, it you know some people that will, will say to me and have said to me uh, over the years all about family you know you can't choose your family but you can always choose how you respond and how you you deal with things and sometimes for your own your own sanity you have to if somebody steals something off me people have stolen things off of us at camp i remember for anyone that's been to camp we have um a toilet out downstairs toilet has positive statements all over that you know little things are all over the wall and I went in there one day and one was missing somebody had (laughs) had nicked it but you know what I kind of felt they needed it more than we did and that's why they took it Mm. and that's that's kind of what I think and and I think the other thing is you know where, where yes people can be mean and they can be horrible there's always a reason there's always a reason and actually and I've had some horrible gasps when i say this to people those are the people that need love more than the people that mm. are full of love yeah we, we had a guest recently um jane v and she she had a great quote which was you know be more curious be so curious that you cannot be furious yes Do you know what i mean yeah exactly or, you know some words i absolutely yeah. butchered it as i always do with quotes but it's yeah. along them lines you know be curious enough that like, furious does just doesn't doesn't no, factor. No. Um, yeah, and we, we we teach the same thing with our trainers and coaches at camp. Yeah. It's like, you know, if you if you have these expectations of people and they don't live up to them, you can get really frustrated yeah. with that and really angry. But if you're if you're curious about that behaviour and kind of under why or what they're missing or what they need to learn or whatever, completely changes yeah. it. Yeah, and you're, you're right. Absolutely. There is always a reason. So... Uh, Fast forward to the now. I mean, do you have like a daily practice of spirituality? I mean, how have you kind of set up life? I mean, I know it's a loaded question because I know, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, well, the thing is now I, I believe, I believe from the depths of my soul that we are um, the creators of our of our own destiny. I still um, 
subject of my emotions. I'm an incredibly emotional person, but I, I kind of love the fact that I have a, a depth and a capacity to love to the extreme and, and also to feel pain to the extreme. It, it has given me, a, 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 I think, a beautiful gift, and that's to understand other people um, and understand suffering and to do what I can to to help people realise that the answers to their happiness lie within themselves because I spent too much of my life looking externally for things to fix an internal pain um, and it's it's there in, inside me and sometimes I have to go to bed and pull the duvet over my head and just give myself a bit of a, a sharp talking to um, but life is a precious thing um, and I believe in love and I believe in in goodness and kindness and I believe in energy mm. I believe that what we give we receive so what do you think has like been the driver behind picking yourself up each time that that will to to live I think because I had bipolar I'd experienced highs so I knew <laughs> Just how good <laughs> yes. Yeah, which what wow, what a gift that is. Yeah. There's people out there that that don't. They have a lifetime of, of adversity and pain and you know, nothing and nobody has shown them that there is joy. You know, they they don't understand love because they've never experienced love and you know, I think it's it's everybody's birthright. If you we're we're getting we're gonna call it a day in a minute. Um, we've got other episodes planned. Paul is going to do some stuff about finding your joy and your uh, and your happiness and all this kind of stuff in the future. If you think that'll be a benefit, if you want to hear that, then leave a comment below and um, and, and let us know because, you know, this needs to be a two-way thing. It's no good just us sitting here recording all this and don't get any feedback from you. Um, but basically, two messages. Um, the first one, what message have you got to people out there that are watching or listening and uh, and perhaps they're struggling a little bit perhaps perhaps then themselves are, you know have bipolar disorder or um anxiety and, and depression what what kind of message would you have for them I, th I think something that that's really important for everyone is that you have a good support network that's that's key you know f firstly i think it's um mental illness um is a very lonely illness and and i think people tend to isolate rather than you know to share and to seek out people that, that understand and can su can support you um and then i and i think um sometimes self-reflection is really really important we w when we become really poorly or really lost it's very difficult to believe that anything will ever be better and so I think in, in some respects, we need to be constantly moving forward. So, you know, know what you want in order to surround yourself by those things. So almost bombard yourself by those things. And I think believe that life doesn't have to be full of pain. Some people can feel so trapped and so backed into a corner and uh, sometimes pulling themselves out of their pain means making some drastic changes in their lives. And for some people, that's really scary, almost too scary. And so they'll hold themselves in this place of pain in order to make the big, huge changes that, that have to be made. Um, but I think there are so many resources out there now. That's, that is the wonderful thing about this day and age. You don't have to be alone. And, and the final thing, which I'll be quite keen to hear about is your message to your mum and I don't, what, what I that don't, would be. I don't even know whether I can say it without crying because I just love my mum more than anything in this whole world and she has no idea that just being alive is, is what over the years at certain points kept me alive and sometimes I don't look after her in the way that I should. Alright. That's very brave. <laughs>
an amazing episode and I think, you know, what it's worth. I think there's people out there that are going to take a hell of a lot from this and um, I really appreciate you talking and, and, and telling me this stuff as well because um, I didn't know. I didn't know. You've always been an amazing person for me and this just proves that you're even stronger and more loving than, than I ever, ever imagined. So thanks. Thanks for doing this today, Paula. What, um, any closing words? You're a git. <laughs> that's quite, that's quite, uh, what is, is that it? No, <laughs> sorry. I'm just <laughs> if you've got, if you've got a mantra, we're going to finish on this now. You, one mantra for people to take away from this episode right now. What would that be in the world of, of Paula Williams? I think it's just, I don't know. It's like, there's so many things, Craig. And when you say this, it, I think you have to, the, the first thing that you have to do is accept yourself for who you are. And then learn to love yourself for, who, for just who you are. Stop trying to be everyone else and someone else. And I, I believe that, I truly believe that everybody's birthright is to to feel love and to be loved and to to feel joy, to feel sadness, to feel everything. And and sometimes we don't allow allow that to happen. Um, I just wish I could wave some magic dust. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, that's been the Conquer Food Show with uh, myself and Paula Williams. It's been an incredible episode. I think you'll agree. And um, we've got some incredible guests coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we've got a lady called Lisa Upton who's got an incredible story. Where how many times I'm going to say incredible? That's about twenty times in it. But um, basically, she she had, she had a, a ten hour brain operation to fix a lesion in her in her head. Um, and she was awake for the whole lot and that sent her on this incredible journey of neuro positivity and all this kind of stuff so that's coming up in the next couple of days um, plus more episodes with Paula and we're recording an amazing episode in fact let me just bring this down a bit right we've done an amazing episode with um, a lady called Natalie she is uh, she's been called the, the Tourette's teacher so she's the only teacher in the UK with Tourette's and she's um, we're going to re record an episode with her tomorrow. It's going to be an absolute barrel of laughs because she is she is a barrel of laughs. Um, Paula, what, what's she's your... Amazing. Yeah, she's what, what amazing. Yeah, what are you hoping for or what, what do you think we will get from Natalie? Well, I don't know. That's the thing with Natalie. <laughs> you don't actually ever know what you're going to get from her. But she, she is, oh my God, she is just... I mean, if you think Tourette's, you know... I mean, to be have Tourette's and to be a teacher and to put yourself out there, I think is just inspirational and incredible. And you know what she's done as well? She's lost seven stone as yeah, well. Yeah, she has, yeah. She's looking incredible. So she's just she's just amazing. And she gives our, our trainer, Reg, some real crap. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I could get Reg on here as well. Yeah. Um, so that's what's coming up in the next couple of weeks. So, um, so stay with us. Please subscribe, like, comment, do all that kind of stuff and share. Share this stuff with the people that you think they can benefit. So until the next episode, Paula, say goodbye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, goodbye for me. Take care. Um. <laughs> <laughs>